I'm Frederick Gerton, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. Welcome back, Leilani, to Pushback Talks. Here we are again. Now, we're we actually recording a Friday, but this is going out on a Wednesday. And yesterday, it was Canada's days. And you know, you're in Canada, so I guess you were celebrating big time your proud nation. It was the best Canada day ever, because it was a cancel Canada day. That was the hashtag that was going around. I didn't use it because I don't like cancel culture and all of that. But it was, in fact, um, suggested by Indigenous groups that we use the day to reflect on the genocide and its legacy, its ongoing legacy, uh, the genocide of Indigenous peoples in this country. Because recently, Frederick, you will have heard that these graves of children are being turned up and turned over and um, thousands of Indigenous children have been buried with no proper anything. And that's being revealed now in my country. So it's a very sober moment. It's nothing that happened like 100 years ago. It's like some, it's quite recent. That's right. So these were Indigenous kids ripped away from their families, brought to residential schools. The families didn't know often what happened to the children. And now we're they're found in graves. Uh, But the last school closed, I think, in the 90s. So very recent uh, and very horrifying, obviously, and and, and, uh, uh, very important that we reflect. A horrible story, Leilani. And, well, Canada is a complex country, uh, but it still produced some nice people. I like you, for example, so it's not that bad. It could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, España, Spain, because we have a friend who was in our podcast earlier on, Jaime uh, Palomeras, who is an activist, an advocate, and, and, a, and a scholar who is organizing the tenant union, a new tenant union in Spain. And he's suddenly been, together with two tenants, threatened to three years in prison. Yeah, it's terrible news about Jaime and the two advocates who are tenants, uh, Alpha and Fran are their names. Uh, They were really simply protesting inadequate housing uh, housing that was too expensive and really in a very bad condition, like uninhabitable condition. Uh, they were peacefully protesting. In fact, they won. At one level, they won their protest and they were granted social rent and they the landlord was fined 180,000 euros. The landlord is a very wealthy, as I understand it, family in Spain, owning many properties, not just residential real estate, but commercial real estate as well. Uh, And so then the landlord turned and I believe approached the public prosecutor and said that these were violent protests and that these three advocates should be put in prison. Just for like simp- 20 years, for like 20 years. It was like something really crazy. No, uh, I don't know. I, I thought that the landlord said just like 18 months and the public prosecutor said, no, no, this is so egregious, it should be three years. I mean, this is re- regular protest. How else do tenants protest but to go to the properties of landlords and to protest outside and to say, hey, our living conditions are, are unacceptable. These were peaceful protests, so... It's pretty scary. So this this podcast is in in solidarity for the people who fight uh, to defend people's rights against evictions in Spain, or of course, also in other countries. And we have invited a good friend from Barcelona to our podcast. It's Saida Muxi Martinez, who is an architect, professor at the UPC in Barcelona, and and also a longtime friend uh, of. Of, of push and, and, and the screenings of, of the film in Spain. Uh, bienvenida, Saida. Thank you. Gracias, Frederic Leilani. So tell us from, you know, an outside perspective, it sounds crazy that somebody who's peacefully protesting suddenly is 
called to court. This happened a few days ago. He was in court for 11 hours, these people, and they're, they're threatened to prison. Is this the Spain of today? Oh, well, yes, it's one of the Spains, as usually Spain has to face, is maybe many countries has to face this at least. And in this case, uh, I think that what happened is that the Sindicato de Yogateras, the, the Tenants Union, is changing things as also was made by the PAP, the platform of um, uh, Afectados La Hipoteca years ago. They are changing things. They are uh, showing and demonstrating that if people organize themselves and ask peacefully for changing and for rights, they are go. They are getting or they are um, arriving to get that that right. And for the the powerful of of ever, they don't want this things changing. So we find and we are seeing how this there are no such a separation, division between powers. Many times the judicial power, legislative and executive are quite confused the relation between them. And in this case it's quite quite strange as, as Leilani said, because the fact that this uh, judge now it occurred uh, years ago and after that they get what they ask for. So it's strange because also now in, in the, go the government of Spain is saying that uh, they are going to change something, not too much. In, in, in fact, uh, they, are, they are, because the rental law in Spain is quite, um, quite bad, bad re re in relation with the other European uh, situation. The, the thing that uh, they, they get is that we have um, rents for three or five years, and now it has been extended in the law of 2019 from five to seven years. But anyway, they can um, fire out from your house at the end of this period You just because they won't. They don't need nothing to, uh, to, to fire you from the house. And, and it's very difficult to make a life if you have not the, the, the security of the continuity in a place. Of course, it's scary. It's scary. I mean, in, in Sweden, we have actually the right to stay in our homes f for life if we, if we be behave well. Of course, then they can use rent evictions and other tricks to, to get us out. And of course, they can also falsely re report people. But we then have a, a, a rental court. So that's, it's, we have better protection. Leilani, you've been in contact with the Spanish parliament. and You've also been making some official comments uh, from the shift. Uh, which is being quoted in the Spanish press. Tell me, what, what have you been doing and what do you see here? Yeah, well, the shift wrote a letter of concern uh, to a variety of government officials in Spain to say that obviously um, to suffer consequences for asserting a human right is itself against human rights. You, if, you, if you cannot try to claim your human rights, if you can't advocate for your human rights and you suffer a negative consequence for trying to do so, that's hugely problematic. So we wanted to bring that to their attention. I actually have a long relationship with Spain and the government of Spain. Since I was a UN Special Rapporteur, um, I went to Barcelona several times. I met with government officials at different levels. When I finished being Rapporteur, I've been continuing that relationship and and I, I have to say I have found this entirely surprising because there I was just last week in front of Parliament in a very friendly environment having a very rich discussion about establishing a national law that would recognize the right to housing. The very things that Jaime and Alpha and Fran are advocating for on the ground. And it was a very congenial atmosphere. And so those two worlds uh, that that you um, mentioned, Frederick and, and Zaida, are very clear to me. And, and what really scared me about what Zaida just said is that it's at the moment of when the tenants union is effective, just as they become effective, then there's this clamping down in terms of free expression and advocacy. And it's that's very scary, obviously. It's like, oh yeah, you can protest until you're effective. To our listeners, the movements, as Saida mentioned, the PA, had, was so, it was a movement that started after the 
evictions that came after the financial crisis. That movement has been so strong that it's also formed itself into a political party who has gained power in in many cities, like the, the, the city of Barcelona, where Ada Colau is the mayor. So these are really successful movements, and they're actually really been able to change a lot in Spain. But of course, Spain is a very divided country where the the right has its threads back to the to the dictatorship and uh, and l- not like other other countries after after the t- dictatorships didn't really change the the judicial system just continued the same judges that were judges during the dictatorship kept going in democracy you can still feel that in spain and i think this is in some way a sign of that those old the old legacy is still alive in some way it's it's a bit scary, Sayida, isn't it? Yeah, sure. And another thing is this: these movements change things in in Barcelona and in Catalonia, especially. And this, the, for example, the law in Catalonia for control the rent is is working, and it's working because the rent rental prices are lowering. And what we think is because of that also, they are trying to to make afraid these movements not to move for rights because they are changing things. And at the same time, the government, central government in Madrid is saying, okay, we're going to enlarge the period of the rent and we're going to, to put a norm that says that if you continue in your in your house, in a rental house, they couldn't put higher rental prices. But if the the house is empty, you can charge 10% plus. But at the same time, this government has decided to appeal the law in force in Catalonia. So the, the law that you have now that is really successful in protecting tenants yes, in Catalonia... It's, it's, it's quite it's being successful. Appealed. It's quite successful. It's, be, <laughs> it's too successful. But I, when we had Jaime Palomeras in our podcast uh, earlier on he's i mean the big fight was to make this into a national law so what is happening with that till now it's only this i i, I just trying to explain they they get this kind of parenthesis okay we for three years we go, we're going to to maintain the prices three years and also these five seven years extended rent rents but nothing else um and, and also well, we have many problems because there, there are many finance financialization interventions in financial interventions in the housing market in, in Spain in general. And also, for example, one month ago, something like that, uh, obviously you know that, that the Madrid government, city government or, or community government, I don't remember, they sell, they sold many houses to a Blackstone or another company like this uh, and they were to a trial but finally there was not um, not no penalty for 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 selling uh, the uh, social housing to uh, to a, a hedge fund to a hedge fund and this is like I mean we should know f- our listeners that Spain is the country in Europe where Blackstone is the strongest. And also because I don't know if that happened in every country, you know that these kind of, of, of companies don't pay any taxes here for the, all these properties. That's scary, Leilani. Do you, you know about these tax redemptions for, for hedge funds? Why is this? It, it's, it seems so crazy that the, the richest people on the planet don't have to pay taxes. The, of course, they're, they're not charged anything like income tax, but they're not even charged corporate tax, which is, that's, that's the unbelievable uh, fact of it. And it's, I mean, governments defend it as, well, it's a way to bring money into the country. It was, it becomes part of austerity measures uh, advocated by the folks at the IMF and, and regional banks as a way of you know, making a country liquid, but of course, it it only makes the country poorer, in fact, and it makes poor, poor people poorer. That's part of what's so interesting about the case that Jaime, Alpha and Fran are involved in here, because it is one of the most financialized housing markets, certainly in Europe. And what this case exposed was the power of real estate owners, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic David and Goliath uh, situation. You have these three, you know, advocates, tenant, tenant unionists, up against this mega 
land owner, property owner, and and it's gotten so far. Look who has the most power here. This is also just another, in my opinion, another way in which financialization is playing itself out, which is the political legal power of these big landlords with a ton of money. Mm. And we should remember that what they are hitting on here is freedom of assembly, you know, the right to peaceful protest. And 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 it's also um, Jaime, who is the general organizer of this tenant union, he's he's threatened to three years in prison because of showing solidarity. It's scary. So the question is how can we how can we show them solidarity? How can we how can we help? I think that uh, one I think is make it uh, making this case visible all over the world and also I don't know nation uh, United Nation U- 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 European Union because as you say is is uh, a possibility to go to the prison because uh, you are asking for human rights pacifically and also there are policemen and journalists that says nothing happened there they were and also the the people who work for the family says no they they were uh, um, singing and eating. Maybe they were not very nice, but that's it. <laughs> so, but they, they obviously they are, they go for Jaime because he is very successful. I think that one thing that changed with the PA and also continue with the with this um, um, tenants union is um, change the shift, <laughs> another kind of shift, but uh, changing the. Um, the sensation of the or, or the idea that the if you have not a house if because you are you fail, no 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 you are not failed. It's a system that fail, and also all this Osimi, this this company that don't pay um, the the taxes, all that came from the consensus of Washington signed in, in nineteen eighty nine. All that's what was there. It's not it's not only Spain. Spain maybe because the the we were more fragile than other countries in in Europe and the north and in the south because the people has no power to organize or to they have uh, they need to to eat <laughs> no? but mm. but the problem is that the the the, the house is, is a commodity the housing the building are, are commodities and and that's a, a, a worldwide problem also remember that this this story, this this fight is from it's an apartment in the central Barcelona in the neighborhood of Raval. Well, near Raval, which, near Raval, near, near Raval, and which is like a, it's been a classical place where a lot of poor people live, and of course it's been it's been heavily invaded by by the Airbnbs, and so it's like it's it's a part where the touristification has hit big time, and and in many ways changing the city. So the Airbnb is also an issue, I guess, in this game, uh, the Airbnb hotels. And, and we, have, we have one, uh, I don't know, what good thing and bad thing from the uh, judicial about tribunals, because at also two or three weeks ago, um, the I don't know who, if the, pro- the properties or the, uh, the owners of or the Airbnb, I don't know who was the one who take the also the city government of Barcelona to, to trial because of this um, uh, control of uh, Airbnb and this kind of, of apartments. And in this case, they, the, the judge gave the reason to the city government. So one <laughs> one hand and the other hand. Yeah, it's it's complicated. I can just say you share you a story I saw today that An Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, just tweeted and said that Paris had won against Airbnb, and Airbnb have to pay eight million euros in a fine for illegal ads. So they, I mean, cities like Barcelona and Paris are are taking the fight to protect the people's right to live, you know, affordable and and safe. So it there it's it is a it's a tough struggle going on, but it's it's uh, not a losing game. I would I wouldn't come to back to one thing, you know, because when I see that uh, people like Jaime Palomeras and these tenants are under attack, if we go out and look to the world right now, who are the people who are suffering most? It's it's the people in the front line. We have the defenders of the forest, you know, the indigenous people, you know, 
defending forests in Brazil and many other in Ecuador, in and many other <laughs> also in in, in the, Canada, in Vancouver Island, there is a big yeah, fight exactly. there. Yeah, Absolutely. so it's so so environmental fighters when they threaten economical interests, they they also got get killed and they get sent to court. So it, I think it's this this is a global pattern when when people and 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 people who are show solidarity are are you know standing in front of somebody else's economical interest. It's it's kind of a dangerous position. So I think. For us, the rest of us, it's very much about to put attention on this and to be to be a solidarian. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've certainly noticed when I was UN Rapporteur and since, of course, is in particular uh, an increase in clamping down on protests where people are advocating for their right to housing. So, you know, or... As you say, I mean, it, it may boil down to economic interests. I have a colleague and a friend uh, in prison in Morocco, Omar Radi. It's a very now famous case. He is a journalist and he was really trying to um, expose the way government was using land um, in sort of corrupt ways and in ways uh, that were denying the right to housing to other people, f- causing evictions, just uh, last week, there was a huge eviction in the city of Toronto. People were defending the right for homeless people to live in a park because there's nowhere else for them to live where they feel safe. And the city of Toronto brought in hundreds of police and security forces to clear the camp. And so the use of force, the use of criminal justice systems, etc., to keep people from claiming their right to housing is becoming certainly a global phenomenon. It's everywhere that I look. Uh, and of course, is also tied very closely to those indigenous environmental movements, movements against the extractive industries. Sure, and, and also the, another fact is that every week, almost every week, there are suicides due to the evictions here. It's terrible. Today, one new, uh, a few a few hours before this, this talk, uh, there was a new here in Barcelona that the man that tried to, to suicide herself, himself was in hospital, and at the time he was in hospital, they were uh, a victor, eviction from his house. It's terrible. And, and we, then now we're talking about the European Union and a member state of the European Union. So it's it's really shameful. And another thing that a, a myth that they say that because you know that you, we in, in Catalonia we make this in, in Catalonia and Barcelona this division or distinction between the owners of one two apartments and the big owners, no? And there was a myth that they say that all. Almost all the rental houses units are belongs to a family or single person or only one thing. And the the Metropolitan Housing Observatory uh, studied that and they revealed that every three homes in the same hands of owners who have ten or more homes. So so it's not true. So they're bigger. It's bigger yeah. bigger uh, companies owning yeah. apartments, and 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 that's the the Airbnb and and the other. I mean. The touristification is a, it's a very strong factor, of course, in a city like Barcelona. But but also, I mean, we should remember that at Blackstone and these the others, they are they are not mainly into the touristification. They are just into to growing their money, and they and they like to do it in in poor people's homes because they know that they can push up the rents. And and Spain has been like their testing ground in many ways. So that's also why. Why the conflict has been so strong just in Spain, I would say. And it, well, it goes so deep in Spain because uh, private equity owns a big percentage of interest in banks in Spain as well. So it becomes this circular, they're lending to themselves. I actually don't understand how it's not a conflict of interest. How can a bank, how could a private equity firm own 49% interest in a bank and then surely they're lending back to their own subsidiaries and their own companies. I, I, I don't understand. That's that's beyond me. But I did read a um, uh, quote the other day from Mariana Mazzucato, who's a very well-known economist, and she said, finance itself is being financialized. And I love, I mean, that's that's right. 
you know, and that's the example, right? That's mind blowing. Can you repeat that again yeah. and explain it? Yeah. Well, she said <laughs> finance is being financialized. In other words, Makes so me dizzy, yeah, yeah, I know it's the same. That. It's like, but it, it's <laughs> it doesn't it ring true, Frederick, in all the work that we've done. Where so housing isn't really about housing. Real estate isn't about real estate. It's about the financialization of finance. It's a way to financialize finance. And finance is like described as a as a service sector, but that suddenly it's not a service sector anymore. It's like its own extractive sector, as the, our dear friend Saskia Sassen says. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 scary. So what are we doing? There there must be a lot of. I mean, there is light in the tunnel too because the the movements are strong. Everywhere there are movements against all this abuse of power, but the thing is that they are very powerful. And now the society also is very fragile because of this COVID and all this situation. Is is, but I I what I couldn't understand is how they think they could survive anyway if they kill off of us. What that they are going to do? It's it's impossible to live alone. No, it's this idea of the. The ecofeminists who talk about the interdependency between men's, women's, and nature, how could we think we could survive if we kill ourselves, if we kill our earth? For that, I think that all these fights are, are together. It's not a question of environmental, human rights, housing. It's all the same. No, and, and it, you, you're totally right that this... These big monsters, the big hedge funds, they, they, they like we talked about Blackstone. We have this talk about Blackstone and and this oat milk company Oatly. So you can both kill the Amazonas, but you can also kick out people from their homes. It's like you can do everything, you know. So, and and for them, it's just business. It's always business first and moral second. You know, the, if moral at all is on on the table probably not but as i mean i think leilani you say in the film you say it's it's uh, you're not against capitalism you are against what <laughs> unbridled capitalism capitalism run yeah. amok um i'm beginning to change my opinion no <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I think what what the, we're in a moment um, where we can, because of COVID especially, and because of these talks of recovery and and regeneration, etc., we can ask ourselves and and yeah, we can ask ourselves what's the vision here? What's the vision? What's the vision for the future for society? Is the vision big? in my world, big corporate landlords taking over cities? Is that the vision that we want? Is as uh, in the language of Frederick Gerton, is, is that who should be the winners? I mean, you know, I, that I think we're in that moment to ask that question. What scares me a lot right now is these and, and Frederick and I have been in the thick of this with Oatly, is the dressing up of this through ESG, as they call it, environmental social governance principles that these corporations are adopting, so-called this, you know, uh, corporate social responsibility. I think it's all veil, veiling or what do you like covering up the, the, the darkness there. And, and I'm hoping that we can really put holes in this and expose that darkness, keep exposing the darkness and offer a different vision. I think that's our role, certainly my role. But if you love capitalism, you, it, I guess then it's a capitalism who is also responsible to human rights and to the environment. Is, can I understand you like that, Leilani? Yeah, I mean, I always say that we we haven't seen, we haven't tried and tested capitalism to see if it can respond to environmentalism, to human rights, it's to social justice, to a, a, a vision of the world that makes the world a happy place. We haven't tried to, to, to push capitalism that way. Let's see if it can be responsive, if the people who really are supporting capitalism can be responsive. It's hard, it's hard to think that. I remember, I, rem I, I remember a screening in Barcelona of Push when I think you were also in the audience, say that where there were some young people who was raising their hand and they were really angry with, 
Leilani, uh, that quote about uh, capitalism, but also believing that you and could do anything good. No, I think that it's. I I, I would like to ho- to to hope that that the society in any way of organization is able to to go ahead together and with with the future uh, bodies also together. But if you see that some people say that the solution is going to Mars, to Mars, to Mars, I don't know. Uh, I think that they think that, okay, we are going to finish this earth and we go to other place. That's no, it's not the solution, but, but obviously I think that there, are, I, I wish to think that in, after this moment of, of pan, these years of pandemia, much people are thinking in another way. I, I, I wish to think that. And I think that especially the young people is, um, so what we have to do is to prepare options for, for them, not to, because if when they have to decide what is going to be their full future, they have to, to, to take an option between two bad options. <laughs> Sorry, but... So we have to, for example, here now in Barcelona, uh, there, there is the renewal and rebirth of, of the cooperative uh, economic system and social engaged system. And, uh, and I think that this is a good option to, to, to show how we can work, live, have our money and not over the others, but and show that there are other options of organization. That's cool. It sounds like we should almost end the podcast with those likes. There is another different life is possible and it's like almost in reach if we want it. And there's a lot of people trying it. And and I think, I mean, and, and I think for many, uh, the movements in Barcelona and Catalonia are an inspiration. And of course, uh, we understand that it's, it's a... It's a complicated struggle and that the people you fight are really strong but we we are we are with you and we will we will stay inspired i i do think that there is this optimism there within reach uh i did read in the guardian recently a report of about young people and it's it's with the young people uh, they are really, especially in Europe, the Guardian did a big research into how are young people feeling about the from the pandemic, and they are challenging capitalism. They're challenging all of the structures, and, they're, and I've said this before, they're in the best position to do so because they're not entrenched, they're not embedded, they've, been, they've actually been quite kept out. So the hope is with the young people who will, who will force a better world. Yeah, and the better world world is possible. Thank you very much, Saida Muxi Martinez from Barcelona. Thank you for being with Pushback Talks and, and thank you for updating us on, on everything. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And Leilani, what, what do we have to say now? Well, more <laughs> optimism. <laughs> more optimism that mm. pushback talks can have more patrons because patrons is the way in which we fund this small little podcast although we don't have enough patrons to fund this yeah. podcast it is it is uh, you could call it solidarity yeah. if you think what we do is important you can also support it with some money it can be a small amount of money like two dollars or two euros a month doesn't really matter but you're welcome to help in, and please, please do so. And I can also tell you, Leilani, that we have now grown our the countries where we have had oh. downloads to 114 countries. 114 wow. countries we have listeners. It's kind of cool. Who's the new one? Which is the new one? Do you um, remember? Oh, you don't remember, Frederick. I think it was, could it be Morocco? No. I think we had Morocco before. I think I, I was guessing Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't, I don't, I, at this moment, I will check, but I, I mean, it's cool. We are growing and it's like, uh, but if you have friends uh, in countries around the world, small islands and so on, please tell them to listen to Pushback Talk because we, the UN has like 198 member states and we at least want to have 200 <laughs> uh, countries <laughs> listening to us or 199. We want to be do better than the UN, don't we? Indeed. 
Indeed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Leilani, and, and thank you, thank you, muchas gracias, Saida, and hasta la próxima. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. To watch Push, visit pushthefilm.com. You can also support us by becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash pushbacktalks. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>